I can't tell you how lucky I feel here. It's English Wine Week. It's the middle of English Wine Week and I am standing boiling. Uh, I am in a car park, I admit that, but I've decided that if you want to actually plant Cabernet Sauvignon anywhere in the south of England, this spot here, gravel and a brick wall, that will ripen Cabernet Sauvignon probably be about, by about the middle of August. But we are having a remarkable, remarkable year when it comes to, to, to weather. Our May this year, the sun never stopped. Every single day you thought, surely it'll stop today. It didn't. And May ended up as the sunniest month ever in England, England's history. I mean, not the sunniest May, the sunniest month. The previous sunniest month was June in 1957. Well, that got the vines off to a tremendous start. And now in June, again, we, we, we are now in, coming on to late June when all we, the, the, the grapes would normally all be flowering. We are in fantastic flowering weather, but of course the flowering's all been done. Actually, what the grapes probably now need is a bit of rain. I can't believe I'm saying this. Here I am standing in England saying, please, gods of the vine can we have a bit of rain anyway well i'm actually in the the um car park at r and r where the beloved rosa has managed to organize the first sort of people wine tasting for over three months i haven't actually tasted wine with another human being since the middle of march it's now late june uh, there are only six people allowed in this car park. Uh, I believe this is, comes direct from the Prime Minister. Only six people allowed in this car park. So we've got five people here and we've got one space continually reserved in case the Prime Minister turns up this afternoon. So uh, I, I think uh, I'm going to start tasting some wine because I've only been standing out here five minutes. I'm already boiling and I have got my own personal Camilla. And Camilla, can you um, start serving me something gorgeous and English and cold as quickly as possible. And I've got a glass, there you are. Whichever one comes up first, I'll have it. What have I got? Blackfoot 2018 oh. Rosé. Okay. I'll tell you what, can you, can you show the uh, label? Isn't it one of Black Books uh, labels are just fantastic. They're completely not inspired by wine. Uh, they're inspired by things like the tiles on the on the on the um, London Underground system, stuff like that. Anyway, this is a rosé. This is Black Book. This comes from the Clay Hill Vineyard uh, in Essex. It's called uh, why didn't they call it something like the Crouch Valley area? And it's a very special area. It's actually been making tremendous Pinot Noir for 20, 30 years. Newhall have been up there, and they make some of the best Pinot Noir in the country, which, by the way, they sell to lots of wineries all around the rest of England. Um, it, the, you've got the, the Blackwater River, and then you've got a couple of miles further south, you've got the Crouch River, and there's a peninsula between the two, and it's a genuinely different climate. I've stood looking out at Pearly Churchyard, looking out to the Blackwater, and the, 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 the rain is sheeting up the river, but it absolutely stops at the banks of the Blackwater Estuary. And then I look the other way and go out over towards the Crouch River. It's the same thing. The rain is sheeting up the river. It's following the water. And you come a couple of hundred yards in from the, the Crouch River Estuary, dry, sunny. A really, really special place. So this uh, comes from the Clay Hill Vineyard there. It's a tremendous vineyard, slightly south facing, beautiful, tranquil view down, down towards the Crouch River. Lovely. Honestly, the kind of one, what am I doing spitting this out? It must be too early in the day. Just want to sit back, this in an ice bucket, and write the rest of the afternoon off. That's absolutely lovely stuff. So let's, let's have another one. <laughs> GMF. <laughs> okay, Camilla. Um, this is a 2017. 2017? Oh, he's got, that's his first one. That's his first one. Just want to show that. Um, GMF, well, I know exactly what GMF means. And any of you who are John Grant fans, uh, he's a singer. Uh, you'll know what GMF means as well. I am not going to actually say in public, in mixed company, precisely what it means. But it's a Seval Blanc. Now, Sergio, the fantastic guy who, who runs uh, Black Book, uh, he has never worked with Seval Blanc before. He'd never made sparkling wine before. He was going to make 
a still Seval Blanc wine out of this. It comes, by the way, from a, a vineyard near Didcot uh, called Utri. And again, this is what's so wonderful about, uh, about England. I'm finding new vineyards all the time that I never knew existed. I know Didcot, I don't know a vineyard there, but I do know that just outside Didcot, those wonderful flowing limestoney, chalky hills start to, to run across the environment. And I bet that that's where it is. And I bet if that's the case, there are lots more sites near Didcot that people could use. Well, eventually this is slightly cloudy because after six months, um, he began to think, this is, probably exactly what a base wine for sparkling wine should taste like not a uh, dry table wine so he decided okay i'll make it into a sparkling wine so he shoved all his yeasts and stuff in did it did six months of it getting its bubble in the bottle and then he decided oh i don't know i think i'll be really cool and east londonish and i'll leave uh, I'll, I'll, I'll i'll just leave the sediment in put a put a crown cap on and i think it's called coal fondo or something that's what the italians to mean by it and it basically means a sparkling wine with not as much bubble as usual and all the yeast left in it so it's cloudy but it's absolutely delicious oh welcome breath of the breeze thank you that's lovely hey Camilla have you got the 18 as well yeah because that's lovely I, I must say I think the Sable Blanc is a fantastic grape um, it's it's badly abused by a lot of people who say, oh, save our block. Oh, it's an inferior grape. Oh, you can always taste it. Well, of course you can always taste it. That's why I like it. I think that, you know, it's it's one of those English tastes. It's it's slightly apple peely. It's slightly raw. It's got a slightly sort of rustic, rural, almost not quite clean yeastiness about it, which I personally think is delicious. Probably because I'm a country boy. Anyway, this is the 18. Look at it again. You can see see the bubble. You can see it's all all cloudy. Even better, even better. That 18, oh, I think I've, I've got to spit it out. I want to drink this. I want to drink the rosé and this all afternoon. Oh dear, oh dear. Right, that's Black Book, which is an urban winery in London. Sergio and his wife um, have a fantastic operation down in Battersea underneath the railway arches. And he's a really cool guy with a real vision of what he wants to do. And one of the things he wants to do, because there, there are other urban wineries, and in fact, all over the world there are urban wineries. Um, he says that London is such a cosmopolitan foodie place to actually have a winery right there that people can visit, that people can involve themselves in the whole experience of a winery. Five minutes walk from where they work or live is just brilliant. And also good old Sergio, he says, I'm only buying grapes from about two hours drive from the winery because he's pretty hot on his on his um, ecology and, uh, and sustainability as well. But let's move on to something else. Oh, Raffini. Okay. That's, that's, that's Raffini. Uh, Raffini is this wine. <laughs> it, it became famous for being the most famous uh, winery that hadn't actually produced any grapes and certainly hadn't made any wine. Um, a chap called Mark Driver and his wife Sarah, um, very focused, very driven uh, couple, um, through all kinds of uh, shenanigans, ended up seeing this fantastic sight in Sussex in the Downs. Uh, and he wanted to get out of his life in the city and the, the idea of buying this enormous great arable spread called Raffini was just irresistible. Well, it is one of the most lovely places in the south of England to visit. Um, it's in the Downs and I think one forgets when, in the South Downs exactly what they're like. You think, oh, the South Downs, oh, they're near Brighton, they're near Eastbourne. They must be lovely and sweet and full of lots of little villages with and cottages with ivy coming down the wall and roses outside the front door and all the rest. It's not like that at all. But South Downs is a savage place. It's beautiful, but it's savage. You wonder, look at the map and you wonder, why aren't there lots of villages there? Why aren't there roads going backwards and forwards across the South Downs? Because it's too savage, that's why. The, the great, the wonderful, the beloved Peter Hall has, uh, has a tiny winery called Breaky Bottom uh, near Lewis, up in the South Downs. Nature has thrown every single weapon and thunderbolt at Peter as he sits nestled in the South Downs. Uh, it's not an easy place to, to have a vineyard. Well, Raffini are finding that as well, because this beautiful, 
beautiful valley that runs up. You stand at the top of one of their slopes, you can see the, 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 the English Channel just over the, uh, uh, the, the hill on the other side. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very challenging, particularly it's very windy. Now, in the long term, this is going to be tremendous because the wind is nature's natural antibiotic and it's going to sweep through the vines and keep everything beautifully, beautifully clean and, and free of disease. It has meant that it's, they, they've, they've really struggled to, uh, to, to get the vineyard developed and therefore to get wines uh, out on the market. In fact, they, they, they were being lauded all around the world, um, partly because of, I think it was a Sunday Telegraph article that came out saying this is the future of English wine and I haven't even planted any vines yet um, but they've played it very well and they're now making some very very nice wines and this is an example here 2016 and already this is a more rounded wine than the first releases I had this is gentler in the mouth still got a lovely chalky windswept kind of brightness to it but uh, I think this is this is beginning to show that Raph Finney is going to be a serious player in uh, in English wine, and I was in English wine all around the world because the drivers don't just think about what happens uh, in the South Downs and South London. Let's try something else. Oh my goodness, what's this? Aha! Dembukino Grey. Oh yes. So this is 2018. All these wines, of course, come in as I quietly fry here. Uh, we're also frying. <laughs> we're no, trying to keep them cold. You're actually doing a very good job of keeping them cold. It's, it's me who's frying. Um, Pinot Gris. Uh, this is... Uh, Denby's is a fantastic operation. Um, it's had ups and downs. It started with a great fanfare in the 1980s. It lost its way and started making over-promoted, over-self-important wines of no great character. But the new generation in charge of, of Denby's abetted enormously by the, the super talented and super committed John Warrenchak, who is one of the best winemakers in this country, um, has really turned it around. They're a big operation. They get 300, 400,000 visitors a year. It's a massive vineyard and to make it work it's got to be run in a really sort of new world efficient way it, and that would show why for instance they've got things like picking machines they've had picking machines uh picking most of their grapes since the 1980s you know when we you know we were actually bringing in the family in the 1980s to see whether auntie florence and uncle sid were prepared to spend a weekend picking grapes not deadly but I think with John Warren Check's extreme talent and vision of flavour, they're making excellent wines now. They've got probably a hundred acres of some of the best land uh, in, in, in the Surrey Hills. Uh, uh, the other stuff is, is more straightforward land, but that's where they, they grow grapes like Muller Thurgau and, and Ziga Reber and Uxel Reber and goodness knows what, Reichensteiner, I should think, anything four syllables long in German they'll grow down there but on the special slopes they're beautiful chalky slopes and this is where the Pinot Gris will grow. Pinot Gris is going to be important because I think we're going to make great Chardonnay in this country. I think we're going to we're going to actually start making the kind of Chardonnay that Chablis used to make about 20 years ago and doesn't normally make anymore. Lovely lean racy dry refreshing Chardonnays but Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc by the way are a little easier to to ripen they're a little easier to bring bring to full ripeness and I think that there's going to be a time when uh, and the time is now um, when when Pinot Gris is going to make beautiful wines and let's just try this one absolutely lovely very dry tiny bit of honey there tiny bit of nuts there a slightly sort of warm dusty quality which is you know you say a little terroir well maybe um earthy dusty warm dry little bit of honey i would age that for a year or two um already though it's a really really nice full flavored dry direct uh white wine very very nice have we got anything else there camilla from denby's oh pinot noir excellent you want to put that into the into the thing i I'm going to wipe my eyes because I'm not used to this sun. I put suntan lotion on as well, but factor 50, first time this year, factor 50, up on it went. And it said it is sweat free. Uh, it is not sweat free. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Right, let's try the Pinot Noir. So if you see me standing there with my eyes 
like that, completely shut, it'll be that the, the factor 50 is actually stopping my eyeballs from frying, but blinding me at the same time. Right, PNL, what year is that? 2018. 18, ah, oh, the great 18 vintage again. I mean, you'll have all heard about 2018. It, it was a wonderful vintage for English wine, partly because uh, so many people who weren't involved in wine got to know about how good it was. All the mainstream media started talking about the best vintage we've ever had. All the, the glosses, the lifestyle started talking about the best vintage we've ever had. All the, all the bloggers, the Instagrammers, they all started picking up on this idea that something had fundamentally changed in English wine in the 2018 vintage, which meant all of last year, there was a tremendous momentum in 2019 for English wine. That's why it's been such a, a, such a disaster which we are now trying to make um, a, a triumph out of, that COVID-19 came along and all of that momentum was in danger of stopping. Well, this is one of the reasons why I'm talking to you today. Don't let the momentum stop. The, the 2018 wines are now coming onto the market. They're showing how brilliant they are. We want all of you right around the country to actually take the chance to go and get one. Preferably go and get, if you have a local vineyard, if you have a local winery, go to your local vineyard and go to your local winery. But if you don't have one, uh, it doesn't matter. The crucial thing is find a bottle of English wine from any county in the country. And between now and next Sunday, crack it open with your friends and say, here, here's to English wine. Now this is a Pinot Noir. Well, Pinot Noir is this great, everyone says, oh, it's really difficult to, to make Pinot Noir. Oh, it's terribly difficult. It's not actually quite as difficult as people think it is. It's one of these wonderful myths that the French are so good at propagating that you can't make Burgundy anywhere else except Burgundy. Well, of course you can't. And, and why should you? And then they say, but Pinot Noir has to taste like Burgundy. I say, no, it doesn't. Burgundy has to taste like Burgundy. Pinot Noir is a grape. You go in Kent or Sussex or Hampshire or Dorset, I expect it to taste different in all four of those places and not necessarily the same as Burgundy, which is halfway down France at all. And by the way, I'd say the same about Tasmania and South Island, New Zealand and, and Ontario in Canada, all these places. Pinot Noir is a grape. It will interpret each different place that you grow it in its own way. And England is showing it in terms of light, fresh, slightly hedgerowy, slightly sappy, slightly rose hippie flavours and beautiful dry, not totally ripe raspberry and strawberry flavours, delicate, restrained, gorgeous to drink. And by the way, an hour in the fridge is just right for this kind of wine. English Pinot Noir is, is making a really strong mark as a fabulous summer red. Uh, talking of summer red. Hmm. It's so hot out here in this Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard in Rosas car park that actually um, this has warmed up in five minutes in my glass. This has probably warmed up about five degrees. So that's worth remembering. When the weather is like this, don't let the bottle um, uh, go out in the sun. Keep it in the shade. Uh, particularly sparkling wines, they can get hurt badly by having the sunshine on them. So keep them in the shade and don't fill your glass too full or drink faster. Either drink really fast, uh, in which case make sure you've got someone to, somewhere to lie down later in the day, or just keep refilling the glass quite small amounts. Anyway, that's tremendous, Camilla. Onward! Oh, I've just put my red wine all over the please keep a safe distance of two meters side. That's exactly what it needed. Haha, <laughs> drinking place. Thank you. Now, this isn't quite. Do you want to? Do you want to see the real colour or not? It looks rather nice. That it's very, it looks like it's a very pale thing. Uh, Should we see the real colour? Let's see the real colour. There you are, two meters distance again. That's great. Yeah, this is junky places. Junky uh, places. Camilla's vineyard. It's hers. Yes. Um, it's a, a, another fabulous operation uh, in the northern east, northeastern bit of, of Hampshire. If you go somewhere like Guildford uh, and head off towards Farnham, I suspect, Camilla, if we went along the Hog's Back, could we see uh, sort of Jenkins Place in the yeah, distance? The other side of the Hog's Back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that northern bit of, of, of Hampshire, which means it is on these billowing chalk slopes that everyone's getting so terribly excited about. Because these chalk slopes are basically pretty much exactly 
the same chalk slopes as they have in the the white slopes of, of Champagne, an area called the Côte de Blanc, the the, white, the, the slope of the whites, um, which produces wonderful Chardonnay and excellent Pinot Noir in in Champagne. Now, there's going to be differences between each village in Champagne. Uh, on the Côte de Blanc, and there's going to be differences between each little bit of Hampshire. Um, Jenkin Place in the northeast of Hampshire makes quite different flavours to say Hambledon and Exton Park in the south of Hampshire, and that's exactly as it ought to be, and I'm absolutely delighted it is so. Now, this Jenkin Place is a beautifully restrained wine. It normally takes a little bit of time just to settle down in the bottle. So this is the—I haven't tasted this now for about eight months. Mm. and it's just beginning to come out it's a that honeysuckle thing is just beginning to rise up in the glass there's a lovely acidity that chalky north hampshire acidity um, the the fruit is of that sort of english apple variety it's something which the champagne people actually talk about it they call it loft apple and loft apple i remember this because my aunt phyllis my aunt Phyllis used to give us Cox's apples for for Christmas, which were picked in September, and she wrapped them in newspaper and put them in a cardboard box, and we keep them in the loft for Christmas. And they have a particular flavour, and it's a curious mixture of sweetness and a tiny hint of sourness. Uh, and that's that. And the, the Champagne people regard that as one of the great classic flavours of Champagne. And that's exactly what this has got here. I'm not saying in any way that this is like Champagne. I've, I've given up saying English sparkling wine is like champagne. There's no point in saying it anymore. We all know it's as good as champagne. It's quite often better than champagne. And it's gloriously different from champagne. So uh, this is an example here. Uh, it's a beautifully dry wine. Uh, it's quite incisive, but the, the bubbles just foam around your mouth. Delicious. Excellent. Oh, you've got more. <laughs> of course. Camilla's second wine, more Jenkins Place. Ah, the Blanc de Blanc. Now, is this new, the Blanc de Blanc? It's our newest release, yes. Because I think I had it. I think I had it last year again. And again, let's see what this is like. Because again, it's uh, when I had it, it was before it was released. Yep, yep. And it was it was quite tight. And that's probably what I'm saying about the Jenkins Place wines. They need a little time to actually blossom. That does mean, by the way, that they're gonna age absolutely brilliantly. And I'm a great believer in aging good sparkling wine. That's delicious. Blanc de Blanc, so it should be. These lovely chalky soils. Chardonnay is fantastically suited to them. But this has got a sort of savory nuttiness coming through the, uh, with, with the fruit as well. That old loft apple thing is, is there again, which I really like because it's a, it's a taste of my childhood. But there's a savory nuttiness there and the bubble here positively foams across your palate. So I think that's delicious. And if, if uh, somebody said, is that the sort of the, the typical flavor of the northeast of uh, Hampshire, just a mile or two south of the hog's back, I'd say, absolutely, sir, absolutely. Onward. Aha. The Simpsons Classic Cuvée 2017. Thanks. Well, I'm back home here. Uh, this comes from Barham in the Elam Valley. Uh, uh, I spent the first part of my childhood a mile down the Elam Valley in a place called Bishopsbourne. I actually got engaged to a girl in Barham. I was four. The engagement lasted 10 minutes. Her mother then discovered us, presumably behind the hedge. Uh, and I must admit, I, I, I'm obviously a, a feckless um, fellow, not the kind of person to get involved with at all. And when I'm in Barham, I still look into the shaded areas and wonder if someone is lurking there with a breach of promise contract waving in their hands. Anyway, Sarah, wherever you are, I remember you to this day with a glass of your local white. Now that's a lovely colour. This is, oh, this is the second vintage I think of uh, of, uh, of Simpsons wine. It was badly hit by frost, so they didn't make very much wine. It's got a beautiful golden colour. Absolutely delicious. 
it's round it's gentle in the mouth it's it's it, again it foams just like the Jenkin place it foams on the mouth but it's quite different personality the, the Jenkin place one is is a slightly more reserved slightly more assertive um, acidity slightly leaner in the mouth this one is a little bit fuller and the pro reason for that is probably that this is in a real uh, hot spot a real sun spot um, uh, in Kent and Kent is that bit uh, earlier in its ripening than Sussex and Sussex is that bit earlier in its ripening than Hampshire and Hampshire is that bit earlier in its ripening than Dorset it goes along like that Essex and Kent you'll probably find the earliest ripening conditions add to that the fact that in 2017 they did get walloped then their, their young precious young vineyards only a few years old got walloped by frost and you've got a small crop of wine here making a really very intense wine um, the Simpsons by the way uh, said what they came from France they they ran a really good um, wine producer down in the south of France called Domaine de Saint Rose makes really nice rosé as you'd expect um, but they came to England saying we are only going to make sparkling wine well that was until 2018 came along in 2017 they made 30 tons of fruit from their whole vineyard 30 tons of fruit in 2018 well they probably made 300 tons of fruit and had to leave some of the stuff hanging on the vine because 2018 was such an enormously successful vintage. This is the 17. I think it's all sparkling wine in 17. 18, because there was so much more fruit, they started making still wines as well. And to their great surprise, they've made absolutely fantastically successful rosés and white still wines. They've also got some red still wine. And I would expect that from now onwards, they've been so successful at still wines that the Simpsons will be making still and sparkling but their heart is in sparkling wine. And I have to say, uh, this beautiful uh, Simpsons, uh, classic cuvee, is it Camilla? Yeah. Classic cuvee. Oh, <laughs> she's brought, you must have heard me talking. She's brought, that's a still wine, is it? No, this is, do you want to try the still or some more sparkling? Oh no, it's more sparkling. If you've got more sparkling, I'll have it. But uh, this is the classic cuvee here I've got. And uh, I must admit, for, it's, it's almost my, my, my home vineyard. Uh, a mile away from where, where I was a tiny kid. So uh, thank you, Kent, for showing how wonderful Kent wines can be. I like this, it's got still rosé. Is it still? It's a rather big bottle. I mean, that's the whole point about, it. that shows how the Simpsons absolutely know, uh, they, they know their marketing back to front. Um, if the growth area in in rosé wines is in big bottles. I just, uh, Camilla, can you just bring that over? And just, just think of that. Think of that on your table. Think of that at your picnic. Think how generous it looks. Think, think how in, uh, sort of friendly and all embracing it looks. The big bottle massively works in, in rosé wines. And all the guys who bring in Provence rosés will tell you the same thing. Put it in a big bottle and it will fly out the door. So well done the Simpsons in uh, seeing how to make that fly out the door. Uh, and this is Pinot Noir, 18 is it coming up? Oh, I think it has to be, they didn't make enough sense. 19. No, 19? 19. 19. Yep. Oh wow, 19! Honestly, uh, who would want a better rosé? Absolutely delightful. It's got that lovely restrained um, dry red fruit with a little bit of strawberry fruit. So I often think it's a bit like pink lady apples, that kind of slightly apple but not quite kind of pink fruit. You get this rose hippie thing again and you get that marvellous chalky freshness and and, and I know the, the, the Elam Valley so well. I, I, I know these vineyards, I've walked them as a kid and I know the wind that comes up them and however hot that sun is, it's just been cooled down as the wind from Kent is surrounded by sea and the, you're never really very far away from the breezes from the, the coast. And I think this is an absolutely delightful rosé. I'm so pleased it's in an enormous bottle. Good. Oh, there's, there's, and there's more. What have you got this time for? It's another still. It's our Pinot Noir 2019. Good show us. Well, um, I tasted the 18 several times with, with Charles and Ruth, and I found my, it got tremendous uh, reports. Everyone loved it. I said I thought it was slightly a work in progress. 
uh, uh, they were non-committal. So they didn't say yes, they didn't say no. But I thought it was one of those things, and it, that makes sense. First vintage of uh, Pinot Noir vines. Um, young vines in red grapes are on the whole slightly less effective than young vines in white grapes. In something like Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay, you, your very first crop can be absolutely brilliant. Normally it takes a bit longer for the red wines to sort themselves out. So this is the first time I've tasted a 19. I'm really looking forward to it. <clears throat> I think it's better than the 18. Uh, they make no attempt to make it a deep colour. Look at that colour. No attempt to say it's not deep enough. We're in England. Wine does, red wine doesn't have to be deep in this country. It can be as pale as you like. Um, I think it's gentler than the 18 was. It's rounder. It's got a slightly sort of fudgy softness to it. Just a nice lingering. It's, it's, it's a strawberry fruit, which I say, and I'd say this as a compliment, that it's not quite fresh strawberries. It's not a, a strawberry straight off the bush. It's a strawberry that you left in a punnet for overnight and thought, oh, I must have those for breakfast before they go off. Now, you might think that doesn't sound quite quite as nice as a fresh one. Yeah, but actually in a wine, it's more interesting. And that, that sort of slightly mushy strawberry flavor, tiny bit of fudge, lovely and fresh. And I would say this, this summer, this red wine, picnic, you won't want any other. Camilla, is that it? One more. One more. is a pre-release. Oh my goodness. I'll, I'll tell you. This is that rosé. And it's that beautiful hand. Oh, what about that for a label? <laughs> the label is to come, but it's their 2015 rosé. Uh, this is another of these examples of all over the south of England. You find things, you think, I didn't know that. I've never heard of this. Artelium is just the latest in, in this gorgeous, glittering line that's developing across the south of England and places that 12 months ago, you say, I never knew it existed. But I do know um, where it is, uh, and I do know where their new vineyards are. They've got one new vineyard just north of Plumpton College, which is a great place um, to be because it means that you're only a five minute drive if anything goes wrong from the best uh, wine college in, well, I, I'm, I'll try saying the best wine college in Northern Europe, but I should probably get hammered by all the people in Geisenheim in Germany and in Bordeaux and in Dijon. Okay, fellas, all right. Best wine college that I know of that speaks English all the time, uh, somewhere near Brighton. Okay, Plumpton, good place. Uh, and they've also got a fabulous new vineyard, which hasn't given any, any crop yet, just on the beautiful chalky hills by Arundel, uh, which again is on the, it's on the, one of the bits of the South Downs where actually it's not quite so savage as in some of the other parts. Uh, this fruit though is probably bought in fruit. Yes. But it shows, again, it, that's a lovely nose. Mm. Absolutely delicious. Slightly fuller in style. Actually, it's, it's a 2015, so nearly five years old. It's sort of ready now. Um, it's got quite an intense kind of flavor. It's, got, it's again, uh, 2015, not a, an easy year. And the, and the grapes, they, they cautiously crept towards a sort of ripeness by the end of the year. I think that shows here, of course, that might not be great for still wine. So you might think, oh, it's a bit, a bit too lean for still wine. It's fabulous for sparkling wine. And I think this is just another example of a new boy on the block. Uh, I think they're going to make absolutely tremendous wines. Um, mine is warming up in the glass. Did I drink that? No, I, I spat it away. Uh, so, uh, now, is that it? We're done. Is that it? I have to say, I have never felt so hot or so sweaty <laughs> or so cooked as I, on, on June the 24th uh, in England as I am today. Um, I can see some shade over there. And I think that if I know my friend Rupert Ponsonby, he will have some English beer <laughs> ice cold at this very minute. But before I do that, I want to say it's English Wine Week. It's our wine week. Uh, it's our country. It's our beautiful country. And the English wine business is now an absolutely crucial core part of it. Please all support it. Uh, and if you decide to become an English wine drinker, you will never regret it. Cheers.